Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Kimpanya. There's a lot to talk about um, there, from a lot of different areas. We've all heard, and those of us who've been reading the papers or watching TV shows, we know there's a lot going on in Washington. We know there's a lot going on that mirrors what's going on in Washington here in Hawaii. Uh, for example, the questions of transparency and accountability how things are being done and who is doing them and how, you know, behind what doors are they being done. And those are huge topics of conversation and, and it's wonderful actually if you think about it from that perspective. That there's so much attention and so much scrutiny on what's being done and how it's being done. Uh, that's what a democracy is about and that's what this democracy is supposed to be intended to do is make sure that these conversations can be had in all ways at all levels with all people. So with that in mind there's a number of thoughts and a number of sources that, that I think it's important that we consider. One of those sources is uh, with my guest today, and I'm putting her on the spot a little bit, but she's my friend. Her name is Rachel James. She's been on ThinkTech before in other areas, specifically energy related. But she is a UH law student, and there's a lot of topics and a lot of groups that they have where they get together and discuss various bits and pieces of what is going on today what is actually happening and I think that's an important perspective to try to get from a law student how they process if they process <laughs> um, and but within their classrooms or within or, or with one another how they come together and discuss some of these pertinent and relevant issues that are happening today anything from our current from the travel ban and, and, our, and what our AG did and if, wh what conversations they have and what they think that means for them uh, on to you know, the the, the I guess the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees. I mean, and anything that, that they discuss. So, with that, let me welcome to the show Ms. Rachel James. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for being here. My Appreciate pleasure. it. <laughs> um, no pressure about anything. Uh, it, it, this isn't to find out how much you know about any of these one things. It's to find out from a law student's perspective what is being talked about and how is it being pursued or explored within your current education system. If it is, and that's, I just want all of us to be thinking about it from a lot of different perspectives. So I'm trying to bring in a lot of people for that. So thank you again okay. for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. So um, first of all, start. Let's start here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself. You're a law student now, but what are some of the things that you have done? What are you doing? Start. Start with there. How did you get? How did you get here today? We could be here for hours. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just be brief. Um, so yes, I'm a second year law student at Richardson. Um, full disclaimer, I'm a part-time evening program student, so we call ourselves night walkers. Um, not to say that we're super different from the day walkers, but um, most of us are full-time employees someplace um, or do something in our daytime um, that doesn't include going to school. So, um, so when I speak on behalf of my experience at the law school, it's really reflective of many of the night walker experiences. I think that's just important okay. to understand that. Let's just look at that for a minute. And I wasn't intending to jump in, but I didn't realize there was a difference. So for, uh, maybe this is for m multiple programs, but certainly in the law school, yes. in the law program, mm -hmm. there are night students and there are day students. Yes. And it's a full program in yes. both? Yes. So the part-time evening program is a four-year program, okay. and the full-time program is a three-year program. Both after completion, you'll have a JD. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. And you're two years into what is a four-year program. Yes. Well, Excellent. I'm nearing the end of my second year. So. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted no, to no, that's a great break that point out of clarity. So. Um, so yeah, so I'm a student in that program, uh, a night walker, and I also work full-time at Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies with Stan the Energy Man. Stan the Energy Man. We all Stan love Stan. The Man. We, we do. love Stan. From the um, energy perspective, we, he, we know that he is doing a lot of great work and we really, really appreciate it what as he does do and, and how you help him as well so yeah, anyway well, so you thanks. work you work with him at yeah. hcat i do i work with stan you get to ride um, in his little hcat car um we just got an hcat car you just got an hcat car. we cool. did that's awesome. that could be a part of another discussion yeah, anyway but yes. um yeah so i do that um and i do some volunteering in the community so my background educationally speaking kind of started in business did some accounting work um and then progressed into sustainability with hpu and then that and work in the community with homeless issues and just with sustainable systems, generally speaking. Okay. Um, did some what makes a system government. sustainable? A system that is sustainable is one that acknowledges its pieces and understands how to utilize those pieces effectively and efficiently. For an ongoing cycle? For an identified goal. 
So I don't know that all sustainable systems necessarily need to go on in perpetuity. Um, I think we speak of sustainability in that way, but a system can be sustainable for a purpose. Okay, and that is that an area from your law degree that you're pursuing at the moment? Is that something that is part of that or is it different? Okay, I like this. So I believe that sustainability really shouldn't be secluded to uh, you pursue sustainability in some realm. Um, I think to have successful sustainability, it really should permeate everything that you do. So yes, in my pursuit of a legal career, sustainability is at the forefront. Um, but I think for sustainability to be successful, like my challenge is to also make sure that others view sustainability um, as an imperative piece of their professional or personal development. Okay, so in that context, sustainability can fit within any industry, any organization. It's not just an energy-related thing. That is correct. Okay. Well, I think that's a fascinating thing unto itself. We could do a whole okay. show on that. I think we could. We some could. Some point in the future. So okay. Next time. All right. So you. <laughs> so okay. So you have. Uh, you've been involved in some business and some accounting. You have brought yourself into your law degree, which mm -hmm. you're about to be two years into. Yes. And that's all wonderful. There's some a lot of energy stuff related and sustainability. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What do you see for yourself? as far as once you get this degree, what is it that you are hoping, what, what is the next step? So I, it's two years away, so yeah. it's a lot, I know. No, it's, I mean, you got to plan at least five years out, right? Yeah, hopefully. Yes, <laughs> well, yeah, we'll put that out there for the audience to think about. At least um, five years out when you're planning. So, you know, some idea. Mm -hmm. um, but so for me, um, because of my work in energy and sustainability, so my angle in sustainability has been social sustainability. I think if you have a system or a society that that highlights itself as being sustainable, but you have people who fall out of that um, in large numbers, and if those numbers increase, then that system or society really isn't sustainable. Social sustainability, can you please define that a bit more? Sure. Uh, I want to um, understand that a bit more. Very plainly speaking, if you have a society that you would claim to be sustainable, but either people are unhappy, they're underfed, they're malnourished, they're homeless, like if you have people that would check off the boxes of discontent, um, in larger numbers as years progress, then I would say that that society does not have social sustainability. So from a sociology perspective, oh there's, a, there's a tipping point. I'm not a sociology major, so... No, but certainly not, but, but, that's, <laughs> but that's a societal... So if you're talk, what you're talking about is, okay, if we've got 4.9% unemployment, those people are probably unhappy, at least many of those people are probably unhappy. In addition to that, there's another percentage of people who are just getting by. Mm -hmm but they're missing this or missing that. Maybe it's missing health care or um, a number of things that are not available to them. So they're also not happy for a number of social reasons. Mm -hmm. And as that number increases is when, and this, this delves back into the political forum there, mm -hmm. as that number increases is when you've got the masses who have decided that a change is necessary. We need to address this in a new way, mm -hmm. right? So, yes. my, so my question there is, there would perceivably or conceivably be a tipping point when the number of people who are unhappy overcomes the number of people who are happy such that a change is made to address the unhappy. Presumably. I don't, that's not a, a question I think you can answer, but I think well, that what I'm hearing from you, this is, that's what comes to mind. It's like, okay, that's an important way of understanding, I think, how we are perceiving, how we're seeing all this stuff happen mm -hmm. from last year's election the amount of energy mm -hmm. that has been focused on making sure that there's a resistance to what we fear, and that's an important thing to understand is what we fear from this administration, mm -hmm. there's been this huge energy, and so therefore the number of people who are discontent has, at least if it's not been growing, it's been much more apparent. So from a, from a sustainability perspective, mm -hmm. How would you, so yeah, I am jumping into this for you a little bit, but no, this is okay. what you're studying on. So, <laughs> um, from a sustainability perspective, yeah. what do you see? How do you see or how do you assess from a societal sustainability perspective mm -hmm. where we are right now? Is there, is there a way for you to explore that thought right now? Sure. I mean, everybody has an opinion, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't necessarily know that what my perception is is reflective of an overall understanding of what is. Um, but you're a law student, so it's a law student's law perspective. Student. And it that's is, 
It is Rachel, the part-time evening program law student perspective. That's right, like, that's right. There's a number of other qualifiers there, but um, we'll start at least with that disclaimer. Rachel James is all I need to know. Okay, well, okay, from the mind of Rachel James, here it is. Um, I feel like we're in a, in a space where there is indeed good energy, um, and good meaning that there's consistent, sustained energy. What that will translate to, um, I'm standing by. So I think particularly as related to politics, people's upset um, and discontent with our federal election is important. But to be able to capture that momentum and that interest and engagement and have that translate to local elections is really important. And I think we won't really see how, how impactful this energy will be until we see how we've been able to harness that energy. Um, I'm not gonna get all super energy wonky, but, um, <laughs> but just to see how, how, how we're able to deploy that momentum. Um, and so if we see broad sweeping changes in our local elections for places that really need to have some changes, um, I think that will be an early indicator of I, just I how much strength there is in that movement. I, I agree, and I know that from what I understand, I don't wanna say I know, from what I understand, mm -hmm. that's a big topic of conversation. All these little groups that are out there, from Women's March to J20 to Indivisible to a dozen others. Right. Their question is, yeah, we've got all this energy, mm -hmm. well, what do we do with it? So this is a great segue. I'm going to interrupt just a minute. Please. Because, um, so recently I met with a student who has been helping to forward the J20 movement um, with UH Manoa students from different campuses, um, or from different schools rather, but mainly on UH Manoa campus. Um, and one of the things we discussed was with all this momentum, we're recognizing a lack of civic understanding. So just basic kind of what your branches of government are, what their responsibilities are, like what your local and federal government kind of bodies of concern are, what are their areas of responsibility. Yeah. Um, so wanting to engage in the process, but really being at a loss of who to speak to and what am I supposed yes. to say and what are realistic expectations. Um, and so she and I and, and a number of others have been trying to figure out how do law students who it is our business to know the law. Um, how do we engage with these groups to not necessarily inform them to sway them in a particular direction, but to really arm them with an understanding that can most impact whatever the initiative they're pursuing? And that is an excellent yes. We're going to jump on that. We have to take a quick break already. Okay. See how quickly the show goes. Did you too hard with that? No, that was spectacular. <laughs> no, that's exactly the direction because I agree with you. Um, Okay, we have to take a quick break. So thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thanks again to our guest, Ms. Rachel James, and we'll be back in one minute. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Crystal. If you haven't tuned into Quark Talk before, you better do it because you're missing out on all the information. We talk about sex, we talk about religion, we talk about everything and nothing. So we've got two gentlemen here going to validate that, right? Greg Kinkley and Roy Chu. What's your take on the importance of talking about these issues? It's very important. It's through, I think, expressing ideas and exchanging ideas that we come to a better understanding of the world and each other. And without that, we live in ignorance and fear. Yep. And Fear is based on ignorance. Amen. Mm. Right. Amen. I, what <laughs> more can I say than that? That's Something in Yiddish. I think. <laughs> sure, it was on a year. Oh, no. Yeah. Come, <laughs> listen to Quark Talk. Tuesday mornings. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Right. As much as possible. So I agree. I agree. So here we go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for coming back. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Mover Shakers and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Um, again, welcome, Ms. Rachel James. So yes, we were just talking about about that various that, that very topic of how do we sustain this energy? So as you've been focusing on sustainability and societal sustainability and all aspects of what sustainability might be. That ends up being a perfect co topic of conversation mm -hmm. for us to really take into this political realm of we've got all these groups, as was mentioned, more than, more than we even know and can name, I think, at this point. Uh, windward resistance and, and you, you name it. There's so many groups that get together um, that are trying to find a way to engage. Mm -hmm. And more and more what we're learning or what I'm hearing from some people is there's a lot of people that want to be engaged. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to be engaged. They don't know what to do. They assume that there's a thing. They assume that, oh, I need to go do this and I need to know what to write and someone needs to tell me what, what sign, what do I write on my sign? Right. The answer to that is, what do you feel? What do you want? 
what is it, what is it you want to say, right? I think it's part that. Um, so from my perspective as a law student, it's important for people to be not only aware of the issues, but understand processes. And not so much so that you yeah. fall in line and follow, you know, and march to the beat of somebody else's drum. But right. really, so if you're pushing against something, you really know what you're pushing against. Yeah. So if you're fighting for something because you have this feeling that you, you either dislike what's happening, or if you're fighting for something because you really feel positively about something moving forward, mm -hmm. um, if you don't really have an understanding of what you're resisting, um, of the systems that are in place that keep you wherever yeah. you are, um, I think that that battle is going to be that much more challenging, and the time between your action and effect um, can be, I don't want to say delayed by that ignorance, but it will certainly impact. It, it, yes, and I think that actually we're seeing that uh, on the federal level right now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that all of this misunderstanding of how the process works now sits in the primary seat in our White House. Yes, that's and, a perfect example, because when you do executive orders and you're like, hey, I think, sorry, I hope I'm not getting... No, please, okay. jump, on, jump on. <laughs> when you say, as president, hey, this is going to happen, and like, Hawaii, what do you mean you're filing a lawsuit? Like, yeah. what, do you, what are you doing? What, what we're doing is exercising the process that our forefathers established exactly. so that people don't come and be tyrants. Exactly. Um, and so I think awareness of that, like, I'm really proud of Hawaii for making that step yes. because I think it heightens the awareness of really the impact of law and how people can use that for good. It's also been, you talk about civic engagement and civic mm -hmm. understanding. Yeah, I've said many times on this show and, and otherwise that we actually are at one of those moments in time like the Civil Rights era and the Revolutionary War period, where there is more, more people are engaged and more people are aware and learning what this process is than has in, in the interims. Yes. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, because in, cause what will happen is, as a result, what we're, I, think, I think what we're already seeing is that Donald Trump that refused to pivot to the center, I think he's just been demonstrated why pivoting to the center is the only way to accomplish anything. And I think that's what he has just learned, and we'll see how he continues with that process, maybe in one issue versus another. But I think that that's an important point mm -hmm. as far as that engagement and, and, and learning the processes and learning the systems. So, okay, tell me from, again, from your, not just perspective, but experience, you get together with other students. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have you, know, you have different forums. You were telling me off air that you have forums that you have. Is this part of this forum, or there you have multiple forums oh, that you get question. together with? Um, so the law school is really great. So I'm I'm really really grateful to be at Richardson um, because it's a law school that values social justice, mm -hmm. um, and it encourages its students to be engaged in their communities. And I don't necessarily know that all law schools really focus on that nor do they encourage people to really think about how the law can apply to things that are important to them. So Richardson is really good about providing opportunities for students to engage um, through like law clinics with community organizations. Oh, wow. Then okay. they're also good about the professors and faculty support having visiting speakers come in from really around the world um, to speak about what they've done in their communities and how what they've learned or what their systems of law mean for the U.S. system of law, um, for Hawaii law. Um, and so one of my professors, Professor Yamamoto, um, he has been a longtime civil rights Eric? advocate. Yes. I know. I have met him recently. Okay. I like him. Um, I admire him, and his work is really phenomenal. But he recently had, um, so he works with students who are, I'm probably going to get the title wrong, but essentially they're like advocates in training. Um, and so he uses his experience over a number of years working on cases like um, with the Japanese internment. Of yes. Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, he uses those experiences and his connections and the legal professionals he worked with through those processes um, to really inform the students today of the impact of Supreme Court decisions and what that translates to for real life applications and actually what people. That's feel. what I. That's what I love about that. So okay, thank you. Um, I really appreciate hearing that our law program here at UH is not just teaching you this is what the law is, memorize this and move on, it's, it considers and it, it encourages you to consider the application of these laws. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't know, I mean, I, perhaps we could just do a whole show on what, that, what you do and what the law school is, and I would love to bring in you know, the, the, the higher-ups and, and, uh, that, that run the program to, to really learn that program too. But I think too often we don't really understand, number one, the process, and number two, 
what the repercussions and consequences are yes. of what we do. That last piece is probably most important. Yeah. Um, I think when we have people who are contributing to the formation of our society, so both in legislation and policy and administration, um, when there's a disconnect between what they are planning and the utopia that they are hoping for um, and how that actually impacts people on the tail end, yeah. um, that disconnect can be detrimental. And so I believe that people who serve in those positions generally go into it with um, with benevolence, I don't think people really come into those positions with an intent to destroy society. Um, but I think the disconnect between how long-standing policy and administrative decisions and legislative actions, how those things impact people in their day-to-day -day lives um, is important on both ends. So it's important for me as a constituent to know because when things go wrong, I need to be able to point to something and say, hey, you implemented this thing and I know you meant to help me, but these are all the ways that it really kind of messed me up. Exactly. So, oh, so okay. So, I think that's wonderful. First of all, that you guys in your program try to consider those things. How do we get those thought processes? And that, that's so okay. This whole thing is just about we had this travel ban mm -hmm. that happened, and there we've had travel ban 1.0 and 2.0, and mm -hmm. both have been shut down mm -hmm. through the process. And it's through understanding the process, and it's through understanding what our constitution is, and what the laws are, and mm -hmm. how it's supposed to work. Because it's about the impact on yes. people. Same thing now, you know, what was a wonderful thing was with the health care. You know, mm -hmm. They wanted to repeal Obamacare. As much as some of it needs to change, and as much as, you know, as many problems as there are with it, mm -hmm. what was amazing was the number of people who showed up. And this is what we're learning, what more and more people are learning, is how you engage the process, right? Right. How you stand up and say, I don't agree with this. And as a result of that, that didn't happen. That repeal didn't and replace didn't happen because people are learning how to engage and they're knowing and they're learning that you know, I can go join this group or that group or yes. another group and this is how we have our voice heard is this so the question goes back to how sustainable is this how realistic can this be to make sure that this level of social justice mm -hmm. awareness at the very least mm -hmm. is maintained Again, you don't have an answer to that question. Uh, you can't have an answer to that question. But this this goes back. This this is the fact that we are relitigating issues from 50 years ago mm -hmm. at the moment mm -hmm. means that there needs to be a continuity. So I think right? the continuity is the law, um, and we can say that we've fallen on different sides of that. We, as kind of the collective, and we as the Supreme Court, or we as the United States, have fallen on various sides of the law. Um, but the fact that we have that record, that we have that constant to reference back to, to say, hey, you didn't make a really good decision here, don't redo that. Or you made a really bad decision, and these are all the reasons why these subsequent decisions really go against that decision there. But let's, let's make it final and concrete and just say that we are going to, like, we're just going to disown this decision. Yeah. Um, I think the constant is the law. And People and law students will speak about it different ways. They'll talk about textualists and realists and how people interpret the Constitution, whether it's living or if it's a static thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, is that has been a thing that has remained throughout our history. And so as a reference point... But it's the interpretation of it, right? The interpretation has changed, That's the variances. Yes. And, and I'll just to jump into this briefly. Mm -hmm. That's the very same thing, and we're not going into this direction fully, but I just immediately noticed that's the very same thing that we have with the Bible. Mm. How we interpret what's said and how yes. it's said. With, and then how we utilize that. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to our Constitution, and when it comes to all of the laws that have come through, how we interpret them from a state to state, from a district to district perspective, mm -hmm. and what are those ramifications for the people? And how, how do we have that? How do we apply these laws to people and, and the impact of these people? And how do we ha make sure that conversation is happening? You do this. We try to have these conversations. <laughs> no, you don't try, you do. There's no try, there's only yes, do. But really, I mean, you do. have conversations with people, but you give people the space to speak about their own experience. So if there's a person who is ignorant of the law, you don't discount what they have to say because they don't understand the process. You listen to their experience and what they have what they have had happen to them or what they've seen happen to their peers or colleagues or siblings or whomever, and you say, if you have an awareness of the law, 
you know, this piece of legislation, this Supreme Court decision, this, you know, district court decision, like, whatever your knowledge is, if you have something that can inform their understanding of what they've experienced, that's a step in the right direction of bringing awareness. So that doesn't mean that you're going to turn somebody and they're going to be your ally and you guys are going to rally for change all of a sudden, mm -hmm. but that does mean that they recognize an opportunity to engage. Yes. And it, we have to take responsibility ourselves to see if we're going to go through that discomfort of, like, do I want to be photographed at that rally or not? Like, oh gosh, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Or we're we going to say, yeah, we're going to wear our, I almost said the P word on <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're going to wear our pink hats <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and show up in places. So yeah. really, but just have an awareness, one of what's happening in the community, who's doing it, and yeah. how that impacts you. So. Exactly. so one of the things that I am asking and will be asking people to do as we go forward with all of this is, mm. is to talk to your neighbors. Yes. Um, go out and knock on doors in your community? I would caveat, listen to your neighbors. That's a better way of saying it. Not I talk don't know to, that it's better, but I would with, just, first of all, we just add listen in and listen also. to your neighbors. No, I, we're I, doing I, a lot I, of talking these no, days. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so yes, I will advocate for door knocking to listen and to learn and to talk with so that we can better understand each other. Because mm. as people have been talking about for a generation now, almost in right now, the, the internet has helped put walls up mm. in, in, in some areas where in other areas perhaps it has knocked them down. Mm -hmm. One of those walls is our neighbor. And we live in little silos and you know, sometimes we know our neighbors and it depends on who we are and how much we engage with our neighbors. But we need to more. We do. We need to hold our elected officials accountable. And ask for community meetings. Ask for forums. Ask for talk stories. Absolutely. Convene. Ex exactly. And bring those conversations to the people who need to hear it bring the issues that are happening, the, the bills and the resolutions that are being passed, heard or not heard, mm -hmm. in our legislature to the communities and say, this is what has been happening. I'm not sure that you're aware of it, but by the way, and what do you think about that? Shameless um, plug, my representative is great, Della Bellotti. <laughs> she sends out these newsletters, keeps us informed. They all send out That's newsletters. Saying. They all send out newsletters. And this is, you know, I, okay. Della's been great, and I have had, I've been a huge supporter of her in a number of ways as well. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and just go off a list and bash anybody. Oh, no, for I just live there, so I just wanted to. Uh, but woo, woo, no, absolutely. You. But I look at it from the perspective of we need, a newsletter is one thing, a newsletter is not this. I can't listen to you if I'm telling you through a newsletter something. So where are the town halls? Where are the talk stories? Where I just get to hear, or you just get to hear from them directly, and more importantly, they get to hear directly from us. I, I'm tired of getting the newsletter, the newsletter that has, here's three questions, please respond to these questions and send it back to me, and therefore that's how they're getting my feedback. That's not how it should work, in my opinion, anyway, but that's, that's off topic of this. That is a, a topic bit, so. for another show, <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. This show's over already thank and there's you still for so much me. to talk about. So. so much. So no, appreciate it. Always appreciate it. A good perspective, a new perspective. All perspectives are good. So thank you so much again. So thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Thanks to the staff, the crew, everyone here, and again to our guest, Rachel James. Thank you. So, see you next time. <laughs>